a greater wisdom than all the wisdom of Solomon. He said, you're blind. You cannot see the truth. You're deaf and you cannot give the truth. He said, I'm the truth. I'm the light of the world. I'm the sign. All right, we're gonna continue our intense, dark, and awesome study of Elijah, amen? If you got a Bible, we're in 1 Kings chapter 18. I'm gonna get right to work. We got a lot of wood to chop. Here's the big question. Can we, how can we stand against the Ahab and Jezebel spirits today? As you find your place in 1 Kings 18, let me set it up for you. We're looking at a story in history from about a thousand years ago. It is in the nation of Israel, it's an Eastern story. There is a king named Ahab. He's got a wife named Jezebel. Ahab is passive, uh, Jezebel is controlling. And then God sends a man named Elijah, who's a prophet to confront both of them. So we've established our basic thesis, and that is that these are actual historical people, but working through them are different spirits and powers. Through Jezebel is what we're calling the Jezebel spirit, demonic, controlling, domineering, overbearing. Working through Ahab is what we're calling the Ahab spirit, passive, indifferent, tolerant, doesn't like conflict and responsibility. Working through Elijah is God the Holy Spirit, and he confronts these two people and the spirits at work in and through them. We've also established that there are three personality types that come. Some people are uh, more aggressive, that would be Jezebel. Some are more passive, that would be Ahab. And some are more assertive, that would be Elijah. And we looked at the fact that we all start more like Jezebel or Ahab, and the goal is to get like Elijah, to be filled with the Spirit of God, to be assertive for the things of God. The fourth person in the story is God himself, who is telling the story and ruling over the characters in it. And you need to know what is true in their life is true in our life. There is a God, he is in control, he is at work, and he is overseeing human events as he was in their day. It continues in our day. And just think of the story for a minute from God's perspective. God had told them, I'm going to establish a nation. I will give you kings. To the kings, I will give my word. The kings are to lead the people in the word of God, and they're supposed to obey God as their ultimate king. What happened in Israel is in many nations, including our own, there's godless political and religious leadership. And God had forewarned them 800 years prior to the three and a half year drought that comes on the nation of Israel, God told them, if you don't worship me, I'm not going to bless you. He says this way in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 16 and 17. This is uh, Moses, another prophet of God, 800 years before the story of Elijah. He says, take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. What happens if God's people don't guard their heart and instead start worshiping false gods, demons, other religions, commingling the worship of God with the worship of that which is against God? God says this, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain. And the Lord and the land rather will yield no fruit and you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord is giving you. What happens is God says, I'm gonna give you good land. But if you don't live as good people, you're going to have a bad ending. That ultimately, unless I provide for you, that place cannot bless you. And so God told them, worship me, otherwise I refuse to bless you. And what happens then, we looked at the storyline of Elijah, that for five generations in this nation, there was one family that ruled and reigned. Uh, They were the kings and the queens and they were godless, evil and demonic. So we looked in the first sermon, there was one generation, it was bad. The next generation got worse and worse and worse. And we're literally making this rapid descent toward destruction, death and hell. And it says at the end, the fifth generation, Ahab, he was the worst of the worst. He was the worst of all. And then God showed up after he had been ruling and reigning for about 21 years through the prophet Elijah and said, no more, my patience is done. But then God still gives him three and a half years of warning and waiting. It's not going to rain, but during that time, if at any point you will stop worshiping false gods, start worshiping me, I can bless you. What we see in this is God's incredible patience. 38 years, Ahab, an awful demonic uh, counterfeit of Jesus, he uh, rules and reigns for 38 years. How many of you wouldn't just endure with your enemy for 38 years unless you had to? Well, God doesn't have to. God can just strike this guy dead or move on to another king, but God waits patiently for 38 years. 
In this, I want you to know there's a difference between tolerance and patience. In Revelation 2, with the Jezebel spirit, Jesus rebukes the church at Thyatira, says, you tolerate, and that's a sin. There's a difference between tolerance and patience. Tolerance says nothing is wrong. Patience says there is. Tolerance says nothing needs to change. Patience says it needs to change. Tolerance goes forever and patience comes to an end. And God is not tolerating, he is waiting for people to be repenting. Some of you need to know that in your own life, you have habitual sin, you have rebellion, you have folly, we all do. And you may think, well, God must be indifferent or tolerant, or maybe he even is uh, supporting my lifestyle decisions. No, he's not being tolerant, he's being patient. He's being patient. And let me say this, uh, God's patience ends and then God's judgment begins. It says this in the Bible, that people are storing up for themselves wrath for the day of wrath. If you live longer, that is not necessarily a blessing because if you continue rebelling, all you're doing is storing up more judgment for the end. That's what happens to King Ahab. And then the day of judgment comes. So here we now see God's patience comes to an end. God has not been tolerant, he's been patient, but now his patience is done and his judgment begins. So the first question is, God is speaking, are you listening? First Kings 18, one and two. After many days, so God warned through Elijah, it won't rain for three and a half years, so it's God's been patient. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. God has a word. In the third year, so God's waited three years, saying, go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. Three plus years, no rain and no dew. I know, I know this is hard to imagine, but just imagine living in a place that was very dry and had issues with water. Uh, just imagine that, how terrifying that would be. Now there's no rain for three years and they don't have the kind of reserves that we do. So what has happened to the livestock? What's happened to the crops? What's happened to the economy? It's dead. The whole nation is a funeral. Every day is a bad day. Literally everyone and everything is dead and dying. And here comes Elijah. And Elijah has a rebuke for the king from the Lord. And he's going to give a word to the king from the Lord. I want you to see here, first, Elijah understands the difference between God's will and God's timing. I've said this before, but you need to get both right. Not just God's will, but God's timing. And so God's will was, you need to go rebuke Ahab. And God's timing was, you need to wait over three years. That's God's timing. If he would have just rushed ahead, if he would have not been on the timeline of the Lord, he would have not seen the blessing of the Lord. Many of the mistakes and errors in my life, maybe this is true of you, I knew the Lord's will, but I got ahead of the Lord's timing. I was impatient. I'm the guy that yells at the microwave. I'm that guy. Uh, right. If you're in the left lane and you're not going 30 over the speed limit, I don't understand why you're there. I don't understand, I don't understand, okay? I don't understand, you know, that's for me. And you know, so, um, and I do know that my new Bronco only goes 101 miles an hour. Um, they, have a, they, have a, they have a governor on it. You can't go any faster. How do you know? I, I know a guy that owns a Bronco and he tried it. So I'm not super patient. And so what I can do is I can know the Lord's will, but I can get ahead of the Lord's timing. What I love about Elijah, he knows the will of the Lord and he waits for the timing of the Lord. In addition, uh, what he does while he's waiting, he spends his time praying. So don't waste your time, invest your time, especially the time in between the times. God says, here's what you're gonna do. Wait three years, then I got something else for you to do. In the interim, the three years are spent praying, praying. It tells us this in James chapter five, verse 17 in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus' uh, half brother says, Elijah was as human as we are. He's not a superhero. He's a mere mortal like the rest of us. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. What did he do? He prayed earnestly. While you're waiting, be praying. Because here's what God is doing when you are waiting. He's preparing the circumstances and he's preparing the servant. God is working on them and he's working on you. And then he'll send you to do or say what needs to be said and done to them. And so ultimately he waits and he prays. And then he goes and he has the conversation with Ahab. This is going to be the rebuke of the king. Let me just say this, kings don't like to be rebuked, especially in their own kingdom, in their own castle in front of their own staff. I mean, you can imagine he's putting his, and just so you know, Elijah, 
the dude looks completely homeless and crazy, like he does. He lives in the woods, he's a mountain man, he hunts, fishes, kills stuff. He's been living in the woods on the run as a fugitive for over three years. Like he shows up, he is looking a little crazy. And he walks right up to the king, puts his finger in his chest, thus saith the Lord. The king, kings don't like this. Let me just say this, nobody likes this. Okay? Especially if you're an Ahab, because if you're an Ahab, you're passive. So you don't, you don't like people being assertive and confronting you, and that's what's gonna happen for him. And what he chooses is faith over fear. He is the most wanted man. He is a fugitive in Israel. There's a bounty on his head. He's most wanted. Now there's gonna be another man who comes in the spirit and power of Elijah some years later, looks and sounds a lot like him. His name is John the baptizer. He's Elijah 2.0. God tells him similarly, go to the king and uh, rebuke him, put your finger in his chest. And what happens to John the baptizer? He's beheaded, he's beheaded. So this is dangerous business. There's lots of reasons that Elijah could be fearful, but he chooses faith over fear. The point is this, the, the best way to overcome fear is to get a word from God and then have faith in that word from God. God says, go, okay, I'm gonna go. Faith looks at the future and says, my God will be there. Fear looks at the future and says, my God's enemy will be there. Fear is what happens when you have faith in Satan. You believe that he's going to show up tomorrow. Faith is what happens when you have faith in God. And he has faith, not fear, he marches forth boldly. And here's what happens, he receives a word from the Lord. And it says, quote, the word of the Lord came to him. It's gonna say this of Elijah repeatedly. And so the question is, does God still speak? Yes, he does. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our world is just as evil and our needs are just as great. How does God speak? And I just wanted to briefly visit this and I was thinking about it. I probably should turn this into a whole sermon or a series of sermons. How do you hear the voice of God? How do you know the will of God? See, once Elijah knows the will of God and he hears the word of God, he proceeds in the power of God. There are different ways that God speaks and see if any of these sound familiar to you. Uh, some of you are the thinker. You like to research and do your homework. Uh, some of you, and I would say all of you, should be people that start with the word of God. Okay, what is God, well, who is God? What does God say? Before I make any decisions, I, I need to get the word of God very centered in my heart and in my mind. Some of you, in addition to researching the word of God, you're the thinkers, you're like, I don't know, I need to run the numbers, look at a schedule, I got a forecast, I got to strategize. How many of you, you're thinkers. People come to you, you're like, make a decision. You're like, first I got to do the research and the homework. I believe in charts and graphs and math. I've accepted Excel in my heart. I need to figure some things out, then I'll get back to you, okay? This is partly me. I love to study the word of God. And on the Strengths Finders test, I'm a strategist. I like strategy. I like plans. That's what I like. How many of you, you are the seer. You see things, dreams and visions. Dreams are when you're asleep, you see things. Visions are when you're awake, you see things. This is God prophetically revealing to you the future. For some of you, it's images. You just see an image and you communicate that and it unlocks an understanding to someone. I'm a bit of a seer. I had an occasion yesterday or day before, um, there, was, there was somebody I met with, uh, kind of a public figure and we were talking and I think it might even have been an interview. And I looked at him, I said, well, your life's gonna change when you hold your baby. And as soon as you're holding that baby, that's gonna be a pivot into a new season of your life. And God's gonna show up in a profound way. And God's gonna use that child to do some wonderful things to change your life. So you need to clean up some things and get your life ready because uh, you know, that baby's gonna need the best version of you they can possibly get. First looked at me, they're like, how'd you know my wife was pregnant? We didn't tell anybody. I said, well, the Lord told me. I said, when you were talking, I saw a picture of you holding a baby. He's like, my wife's pregnant. We didn't tell anybody. I was like, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I saw you holding the baby. So this weekend, his wife had the baby. Sent me a text photo. He's like, this is the baby. I was like, I know, I've already seen this photo. <laughs> I saw this photo a long time ago. I, I wish I could have sent it to you, you know? Uh, some of you are seers, okay? How many of you aren't just seers, you're hearers? And, and that can mean when you're studying the Bible, God just highlights it and you're like, Burp, that's it, that's the word of the Lord. And it fits the perfect situation. Or you get a word from God, God tells you something. Uh, and you get a word, how many of you are word people? 
I'm more of a word person too. Obviously, I like the Bible. I have more than one. I really like it a lot. And, uh, and I had one recently, just in the back of this room. We were at uh, Real Men on Wednesday nights, and I like to be down on the floor thanking the guys for coming, shaking hands, honoring them, because uh, I have a big heart for the men. I love the men, and I want them to know that they matter to me. And so the men were all walking out, and there was a group of men, and they didn't make eye contact. And, you know, and God said, uh, greet Mike. I was like, huh? So I look over, there's a, like a whole bunch of dudes walking out and God's like, that's Mike, greet Mike. So I walked up, I said, hey, wait a minute, tap him on the shoulder. He's like, yeah, I said, hey, thanks for coming, Mike. He looked at me, he's like, huh? How'd you know my name? I'm a first time visitor. I said, well, God said to greet Mike, I assume you're Mike. Dude looked real spooked, okay, so, <laughs> right? So then I talked to, so then his brother's serving here. His brother's like, how'd you know my brother's name was Mike? I was like, I have no idea. I was hoping, you know? <laughs> you know, he said, I've been trying to get my brother to come to church forever. He wouldn't come to church. Finally, I got him first time to come to Real Men's. And he's, you know, he's not sure about Christianity and all this God stuff. He said, and then you walked up and introduced yourself and welcomed him by name. I said, yeah, tell him there's a God who knows him and has been looking for Mike. See, some of you are here, and it's people like, how do you know it's true? I mean, I, you know, I got Mike. I mean, there was like 400 guys and I found Mike. I don't know. Anyways, how many of you are feelers? And you don't have like a, you don't have a word, you don't have a, but you have a sense, you have a gut, right? How many of you, you're like, I don't know. I think the Holy Spirit lives in my gut. I just, I, I sense things, I feel things. Um, there's a line in the book of Acts where it says, uh, they made a decision, the church did, because quote, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit in us. They're like, how'd you make the decision? They're like, it felt good to us. And the Holy Spirit, he said it felt good too. Like, okay, do you, do you have a verse? Do you guys get a vision, a dream, an angel? They're like, nope, all our guts were aligned, you know? Uh, <laughs> <all right. laughs> okay. How many of you, you just, you have an intuition, you have a discernment. You're like, I can't explain it. Right, and this is my wife, Grace, and so we're different. Let me just say this. Oftentimes, the way you hear the word of the Lord, it's different when you're married. So I'd be like, Grace, did you see something? Hear something? She's like, no, I felt something. I was like, ah, I don't understand that. But she'd be like, ah, there's something off with that person. We can't trust that person. That person's really wonderful. They love the Lord. Uh, that wasn't true when they were talking. I was like, how do, how do you know? She's like, I don't know. And here's, we've been married 30 years. She knows stuff. She can sense people. I mean, I'm shocked that she chose me. I mean, I'll just be honest with you, you know, with that level of discernment, uh, I don't know how I got into this relationship, you know? So it's not perfect. She had an off day and I snuck in, you know? But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, but how, how, how many of you though, it's just, uh, you just sense it. You're like, I don't know. And then what you do, you pray and you wait and that sense gets confirmed. Give it a look like, oh, well, then we got to know them. Yeah, they're great. Or, oh, then we got to know them. Oh, they're not great. Just give it a little time. In addition, how many of you are doers? You just, you're, you wake up every day. You try to stay active, try to stay busy, one foot in front of the other. And if something happens, you're like, I just pivot. So for uh, Elijah, he's at the brook. He lives by a brook and then drought comes and the brook dries up. So he's got to go somewhere else. Just pivot. Some of you find God's will by just being active. You're like, I get up, I do what I think is best and I keep moving and God can always redirect me. You're not the people that are like, I'm just gonna sit here unless the Lord says go. You're like, I'm gonna be moving and he can put me wherever he wants, but I'm gonna be moving. You're doers, you stay active and you find the will of God. And some of you, that's how you found your business, your job. You're like, I don't know. I just kept moving and God kept directing my steps and I ended up in the will of God. Last one, there are outliers. So there are thinkers, seers, hearers, feelers, doers, and outliers. These are the people, they get an angel. Angel showed up. Like Moses, the bush is on fire. He has a conversation with the bush. Like, that's different. Um, you know, you get a miracle. You're like, I don't know, God healed him. I, you know, something happened. Um, these are supernatural, and sometimes it's even the audible voice of God. These are, these are outliers. They don't happen all the time, but they do happen. Well, everything that God creates, Satan counterfeits. And so what's interesting, back to the story of Elijah, there's the prophet and there's 850 counterfeit false prophets of Baal and Astra that he's about ready to have a showdown with. In addition to the Holy Spirit, there's the demonic spirits of 
Asherah working through Jezebel and Baal working through Ahab. And so Elijah needs to be discerning because there's lots of prophecies and words and visions and activities. And is this of God or not of God? Is this true or a counterfeit? And so um, what we're seeing is, somebody say this, one of my theses in the Bible is it's not old, it's eternal. And it, it's, not, um, it's not just what happened, it's what always happens. Because even though people come and go, the demons remain the same. And so as we read this, some of you be like, this is so primitive. Uh, you know, 3000 years ago, you know, Baal, Asherah, pagan deities, you know, primitive religion. Thankfully we've evolved beyond that. And then I saw this at uh, National Geographic this week. National Geographic is reporting that paganism is on the rise. I'll read it to you. Um, at least 1.5 million people in the US identify as pagans. They're worshiping old demonic gods and pagan religions, up from 134,000 in 2001. Tenfold increase in about two decades. They range from Wiccans to Kemetics to TikTok witches and heathens. Quote, there is a move away from organized religions and towards spirituality, says Helen Berger, author and sociologist of contemporary paganism and witchcraft. Here's what's driving it. Female empowerment. Jezebel and gay rights movements, Ahab, passive men, and the climate crisis, Baal, the God of environmentalism, we're gonna talk about him in a minute, and a desire for a more life-affirming religion, tolerance. Okay, just you give time and eventually the Bible just proves itself true. It says they have fueled uh, interest in the growing spiritual community, she adds, and then they mentioned Sedona, okay? In the past decade, hashtag, is that how you say it? I'm old, I don't go on the internet. Um, hashtag witch talk, TikTok witches, has more than 35 billion views and popular TV shows like The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, Vikings, Supernatural, and American Horror Story, Coven, are all helping drive increased interest. New days, old demons. And so what you need is like Elijah, a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Okay, was that God or not God? Was that the Holy Spirit or an unholy spirit? So coming up, uh, we're gonna have Easter next week. And then the week after, I've got a special friend coming, uh, a dear friend of mine, Dr. R.T. Kendall. He's preached for us before. He is a legend. He's one of the greatest living theologians on the earth. He's gonna do a whole talk on a book that he wrote called Sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. It's gonna teach you how to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Don't miss it. That being said, let's jump back into the story. The next question is, God is working. Are you noticing? First Kings uh, 18, three through eight. And Ahab called... Obadiah, who was over the household. So Obadiah, he works for the political leader, Ahab. Now, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. He's a man of God. And when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, literally killed them, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them bread and water. And Ahab said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive. The drought is severe and not lose some of the animals. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went one direction by himself. Obadiah went in another direction by himself. And as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized and fell on his face and said, is it you, my Lord, Elijah? And he answered, it is. So here we see uh, Obadiah and he, uh, he comes across Elijah. This is God's providence. God's providence is two things. God is sovereign and he's good. And he works things out for good because he's good. He's in the details. Our God is sovereign, he is in control, he does rule and reign. It's good to know that. And sometimes his providence literally causes your path to intersect with other people. You're like, how did you guys meet? You're like, this is the weirdest thing. No, it was the providence of the Lord. You know, God, God had you bump into each other. That's, 
Those are some of the most important encounters of our life. We didn't have them scheduled, but God did. And so Obadiah here, he's a man of God. There is a book in the Bible called Obadiah. This is not the same guy. He just has the same name. He is a man of God and he's working for King Ahab. Ahab is a demonic and godless man. But ultimately he's like Joseph in Egypt. He's like Daniel with the Babylonian Persian empires. He's like Nehemiah, uh, when I think it's the Persian empire where he is in a significant trusted political position for an evil king and kingdom, but he is a man of God. And sometimes, here's the big idea. Sometimes God will even send godly people into politics. Not lots, there's only one here. Um, <laughs> the whole story, there's one godly person in the government, you know? And so pray we can have one, you know, that'd be great. So anyways, um, what happens is he says that he was basically the human, God used him to save the prophets. Jezebel murdered and slaughtered all the prophets because she wanted Asher and Baal to be worshiped, not the God of the Bible. So you gotta get rid of all the Bible teachers. Obadiah says, I took a hundred guys who were still alive and I've hidden them in caves, preserved their lives, and I am bringing them provision to sustain their life. He's saving and sustaining the lives of a hundred of God's servants. And his path crosses with Elijah. He honors Elijah as a man of God. He bows down, fell on his face, calls him my Lord. And what we see here is that Obadiah is part of a remnant. Paul's gonna use this in the New Testament and he's gonna talk about God always preserves a remnant. Okay, and as dark as things are, the good news is there are some people who do love and serve the Lord. The moral of the story is even though it gets dark, there is still a faithful remnant and God uses the remnant for a revival. It's like he keeps a few embers burning so that then he can send the fires of revival again. And so you just need to know that these prophets of God, these servants of God, they've basically gone underground. They're like the underground church. There's so much persecution that they've gone underground. There are good Bible teachers, you gotta find them. There are good Christian schools, you gotta find them. There are good churches, you gotta find them. And sometimes you're like, is there anybody left? Well, yeah, God has a remnant. And, and sometimes you just need to know that to be encouraged. Now, what happens here is, uh, Obadiah and Elijah, they're both men of God. They're practicing something called civil disobedience. Let me explain this. Um, civil disobedience is where the servants of God disobey the government so that they can remain loyal and faithful to God. What happens here is the government has sent out a decree. No more worshiping God. We're closing the Christian schools. We're canceling the Bible teaching. We're murdering the pastors. Um, you need to have transgenderism and sexual confusion and lots of sexual sin, lots of tolerance and diversity, and we're gonna sacrifice our children to the demon gods. It's all very contemporary. New days, old demons. Here, Obadiah and Elijah are like, we're not worshiping demons, we're worshiping God. And Elijah, he's a fugitive, and Obadiah, he's disobeying his own king who pays his salary, he's taking the king's salary to preserve a hundred prophets, which I think is awesome. I can't imagine like, hey, I've got a bonus, great. The prophets need it. I just love that. But they're practicing civil disobedience. And even here, Obadiah is gonna say, uh, the command, the, the law is, if anybody meets you, they need to kill you or arrest you or report you. This is civil disobedience. Every time the government tells people to do something that God forbids, the Ahabs in the pulpit always go to Romans chapter 13. And Ahab is a coward. And sometimes cowards quote verses so that they look like they're being faithful when they're faithless. Romans 13 is a scripture in the New Testament. It talks about obeying the government, it does. First and foremost, it's written by a guy named Paul who writes four books of the New Testament from jail. So whatever he's talking about, it must be big enough that you can get arrested for disobeying the government. Yeah. Number two, he says in Romans 13, that there is government and God. And that government is not over God, that God is over government. And that government derives its authority from God. Governmental authority is not innate, it is derivative. They don't have authority, they derive it from God who grants them a measure of his authority. And so when the government tells you to do something that God forbids you to do, you have to choose your loyalty and your loyalty has to be to the highest authority. Your loyalty must be to your God, not your government. That's civil disobedience. 
This is not rebellion. This is not lawlessness. This is not hatred of authority. This is honoring of highest authority. I'll give you some examples. In addition to Obadiah and Elijah, this happens in Egypt when the Hebrew midwives are told, murder all the babies. They say, we don't do that, we're pro-life. And so the babies, boys grow up and one of them is Moses who leads the Exodus and frees God's children from slavery. In addition, this happens as well in Babylon. There are three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you like the veggie tales, it's Rack, Shack, and Benny, baby. It's Rack, Shack, and Benny. And if you know the story, King Nebuchadnezzar is worshiped as a God because when government takes over religion, then it replaces God with the highest political leader who is worshiped as a God. It's all God creates Satan counterfeits. This is a counterfeit of Jesus and his kingdom. And what happens is Nebuchadnezzar has a big statue made of himself, tells everybody, uh, bow down and worship me. And historians say that upwards of 300,000 people bowed down to worship, including those who profess to be believers. Three guys stood up and they literally stood out, Rack Shack and Benny. Civil disobedience. They're like, we can't worship the false God, we worship the real God. Daniel was told as well that uh, he was not allowed to pray publicly. And so what he does is he opens the windows and he goes to a higher place so he can be seen and he kneels down and he prays, civil disobedience. He did that during the reign of King Darius in Persia. You're gonna see over and over again, prophets and politicians have had on collisions. Okay, little rap moment for me, but prophets and politicians have had on collisions. It just keeps happening in the Bible. In addition, in the New Testament, uh, Acts chapter four, the religious leaders told the first disciples, no more preaching Jesus. You could do self-help, positive self-esteem, you know, give some motivational talk. But literally they said, no more Jesus. It's just Jesus, 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 no more Jesus. Acts chapter five, they said, we need to obey God, not men. We're preaching Jesus. That's civil disobedience. And what we're seeing here is the same thing that Jesus Christ modeled. Jesus Christ practiced civil disobedience. In that culture, you worshiped your government and the head of your government was worshiped as the highest authority and God. You called Caesar Lord. And you could have whatever religious belief you wanted as long as you would publicly declare Caesar is Lord. Jesus comes along and he says, no, actually I'm the Lord. And people start worshiping him as Lord. One of the shortest confessions of Christian faith is simply this, Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, the government didn't like that. So they arrested him and killed him because he was practicing civil disobedience. And he rose from the dead, came back three days later and said, I told you, I'm the Lord. And so there is going to be a time when the government is going to tell you to do something that God tells you not to do. Like when COVID hit, churches should have said, no, we're staying open, we worship God. Okay? When, when, the, when the government comes along and says, here's what you need to teach kids about sex and gender, the answer is no. We can't tolerate that. That's, that's not what our God says. When the government comes along and says, uh, the highest authority is not the parents, but the government, the answer is no. The answer is no, because that's not what the Lord says. There are times when you're not looking for a fight, but when they pick the fight, you've got to have the fight because you can't tolerate that which is against God. Next point, God is faithful, are you trusting? We'll jump back into the story. First Kings 18, eight through 16, go tell your Lord, behold. So Elijah's giving Obadiah a message to deliver to his boss, King Ahab, who probably doesn't know he's a believer. Go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah's here. And he said, how have I sinned against you? Obadiah, he's fearful that you would give your servant into the hands of Ahab to kill me as the Lord your God lives. There is no nation or kingdom where my Lord is not sent to seek you. He's like, they have expanded the search for you to other nations. You're the most wanted man on the earth. And when they would, uh, there is no nation or kingdom where my Lord is not somebody to seek you. And when they would say he is not here, he would take an oath of the kingdom or nation that they had not found uh, you. What he's saying is we took an oath. If we found you, we'd kill you or arrest you. I just met you. I don't wanna kill you. I don't wanna arrest you. I certainly don't wanna go tell Ahab that we're friends. 
And now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And as soon as I have gone from you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you. I know not where. And so when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will, he'll kill me. He'll kill me. Although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Hey man, I went to camp. You know, I was homeschooled. I don't want to die. Has it not been told to my Lord what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? It's like, I got a hundred dudes need me to stay alive. hundred men of the Lord of the prophets. I hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he will kill me. He keeps coming back to his deepest fear. This is his fear bond. I don't want to die. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives, as the God who rules angels that can defeat demons, before whom I stand, it's just amazing. He's like, I, I, I'm gonna stand in front of God. I, I just, just tell you what I just saw. I see every one of us standing before the Lord. And what Elijah says is, you know what? It's not just the last day that I stand before the Lord. It's every day I stand before the Lord. And every day I stand before the Lord and I give an account for me. We're all gonna stand before the Lord and give an account. And what Elijah is saying is, I'm gonna prepare for the day that I stand before the Lord by standing for the Lord every day until I'm standing before the Lord. Amen. This is his mindset, this is his courage. Um, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him and Ahab went to meet Elijah. So here, what we see, we saw that Ahab is passive, Jezebel is aggressive and uh, Elijah is assertive. Here he's being assertive. He is taking the fight to Ahab and Jezebel. He says, tells Obadiah, tell him, ding, ding, see you in the ring. Today is the day, right? This is it. This is like the old Western showdown. I'll see you in the middle of the street. We're pulling guns. Only one's going home for supper. That's where we are. This is a conflict. This is a fight. And so ultimately, Obadiah begins with fear. Now what he says is that he feared the Lord greatly and he had feared the Lord from his youth. So his life was lived in fear of the Lord, but in the moment he had a fear of death. Let me say this, you can be a good believer and have a bad day. He's a good believer, but he has a bad day. And if you stop fearing the Lord, you're capable of fearing anyone or anything. Who or what do you fear? Do you reverence? Do you regard? Do you submit to? Do you surrender to? In this moment, he fears death. And you can't fear death and fear the Lord. You can't fear the Lord and fear anyone or anything else. Let me talk briefly about fear. He is a good believer. He is having a bad day. Number one, fear makes you a false prophet in your own life. Here we have Elijah, who's a prophet. Obadiah is hiding a hundred prophets. And at this moment in his life, he's a false prophet. What he says is, if I go tell Ahab, Ahab's gonna wanna kill me. The Holy Spirit's gonna move you. I won't be able to find you. You're gonna live, I'm gonna die. That doesn't happen. That's a false prophecy. Let me say this. The most dangerous false prophet in your life is you, is you. Well, this is gonna happen and they're gonna say this and they're gonna do this and, and then this is gonna happen. So now I need to make these decisions or feel these feelings or no. What is the word of the Lord? God didn't tell Elijah, tell Ahab, uh, rather tell, uh, God didn't tell Elijah, send Obadiah to be killed by Ahab. That's not what he said. God already told him what was gonna happen. Here he's got fear and he's a false prophet in his own life. And what happens is fear will come upon you, but you can't let it in you. Hey, you're gonna see in 1 Kings 19, fear comes upon Elijah. He battles with it too. You're gonna have fear come on you. You can't let it in you. If you let it in you, now you're allowing a spirit of fear to control you. Fear is powerful because it comes with a demonic spirit. It says uh, this way in 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Fear comes with a demonic spirit. Faith comes with the Holy Spirit. See everything God creates, Satan counterfeits. When you're operating by faith, you're being led by the Holy Spirit, like Elijah. When you're operating in fear, you're being led by an unholy spirit. And here it is on Obadiah, wants to get in Obadiah. 
It's gonna come on you. You can't let it in you. You need to get it off you. I'll give you two scriptures. 2 Timothy 1, 7. God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity. When you're fearful and timid, you know that's not of the Lord. But of power, that's the Holy Spirit, love, which is the fruit of the Spirit, and self-discipline or self-control, which is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. In addition, 1 John 4, 18 says, there is no fear in love and perfect love casts out fear. When you've got fear on you and it wants to get in you, you need the Holy Spirit in you to give you faith that God loves you and he's going to be there for you. And then you march forward in courage rather than retreating as a coward. This is where Obadiah finds himself. And what we see is that he, ha he is a good man, he has a bad day, but he overcomes his fear. Some of you have got to learn to overcome your fear. Sometimes the best thing to do, run at your fear, run at it. Don't run from it, don't work around it. If there's a person you need to have a conflict with, do like Elijah does, not like Obadiah. Elijah's like, we're gonna have a fight today. Obadiah's like, ah. Elijah's like, ah, if somebody's gonna be scared, it's not me. Tell Ahab I'm coming for him. Sometimes you gotta run at that person or thing you fear. And you realize that there's no reason to fear, that the Lord goes with you. You're stronger than you think and he's better than you believe. Now, what we're seeing here, it's not just Elijah versus Ahab, it's God and the Holy Spirit versus demons. So ultimately here, truth be told, the battle belongs to the Lord. So you're gonna see the showdown, it's gonna come up in a future sermon, but 850 false prophets of Asher and Baal, they are empowered by a legion of demonic spirits. And here comes Elijah, he's got the Holy Spirit. Here's the good news. When they come to the showdown on Mount Carmel and it's coming up, here's the fight, 850 versus one. But if the Lord is on your side, your odds are good. That's the moral of the story. It doesn't matter how many are on the fight, it matters if you're on God's side of the fight. And that's gonna be the story of Elijah. Now, what happens is uh, Baal and Asherah are the demons that they're worshiping. And to this day, these demons are still at work. We're still battling them. And so I'll, I'll show this to you. Um, it's interesting. This is uh, Newsweek this week. Headline, Satan is getting hot as hell in American pop culture. People are really excited about Satan and demons. A part of it, they were talking about a movie coming out called Nefarious, uh, put out by uh, Steve Deese from the Blaze, Dace from the Blaze. He was in town recently, we talked about. He's a Christian trying to do sort of a psychological horror thriller. What does demonic possession look like? I previewed it and uh, it's good. I mean, like, not like, you know, good for your kids, but, but it's, <laughs> it's theologically, biblically accurate and it's profoundly troubling. But here's what the article says. Pew Research reported that 62% of American adults believe in hell up from 58% in 2014. It's amazing, we had COVID, elections, BLM, people were like, I believe in hell. <laughs> it, it keeps interning in my life, so it must be real. And pop culture appears to be taking full advantage of the curiosity that surrounds hell and its inhabitants. The devil is front and center in movies, TV shows, podcasts, and even children's books. There are Satan after school clubs. There's the Exorcist Files in which Father Carlos Martins recreates exorcisms and the podcast routinely tops the list of the most popular in the spirituality categories. On Netflix alone, there are dozens of titles dealing with hellish demons including Warrior Nun, Devil in Ohio, The Bastard Son and the Devil Himself, and Lucifer, in which the ruler of hell runs a piano bar in California. Comedy is also fair game, thus Ted Danson plays a torturous demon who is prone to mistakes in the Netflix series, The Good Place. Humans crave spirituality, says Martins, host of The Exorcist Files, but a Gallup poll in 2021 noted that for the first time in US history, less than half of all Americans were members of a church, synagogue, or mosque. To fill the void, many are embracing, quote, a rejection of received social customs and expected behavior norms in favor of embracing me first pleasure pursuing intense feelings and experiences, Martin told Newsweek. The adoption of Satan as a figurehead is merely another shock ceiling through which the movement is broken through. People are like, I wanna be spiritual, but I don't want the Holy Spirit. 
So I would like, I don't want a spirit that tells me no, I want a spirit that tells me yes. I don't want a spirit that calls me to repentance, I want a spirit that calls me to tolerance. I don't want a spirit that changes who I am, I want a spirit that celebrates who I am. I don't want a spirit that calls me to humility, I want a spirit that calls me to pride. And I don't want a spirit that calls me to self-control, I want a spirit that lets me indulge all of my pleasures. So now what we have is spiritual people, but not Holy Spirit people. Back to the story, God is commanding, are you obeying? 1 Kings 18, starting in verse 17. When Ahab saw Elijah, right? I just wish I could have seen that. (laughs) Ahab's a coward, here comes Elijah. Ahab said to him, is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel. You notice he has the conflict, he's assertive. He doesn't allow the subject to be changed. We're not talking about me, boy, we're talking about you. Finger in the chest. I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, your generations of demons, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. That's the word for demons. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel. We're gonna have a fight tomorrow. Invite everybody. I'm coming alone. And the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. It's interesting, Jezebel prepares a feast just like Satan ate with Eve, these demonic counterfeit leaders eat with Jezebel. These Baals, they're demons. Demons are like people, they have names, personalities, and anti-ministries. So here, they're the Baals, that's their name. They have different personalities, just like you and I have different skills and talents and abilities. And just like God gives his people ministries, they have different anti-ministries. Let me tell you this, every time you're doing ministry, Satan and demons are doing anti-ministry. Every time you're trying to open the church, they're trying to close it. Every time you're trying to bring unity, they're trying to bring division. Every time you're trying to teach the Bible, they're trying to cancel the prophet. That's the way it works. That's what Elijah's up against. Baal was the king of the demons and he was considered the God over the storms. And so by God not allowing it to rain for three years, that just completely defeats and humiliates Baal because his old job is make it rain. That's his old job. With him is Astra who's considered the leading and highest ranking female demon. She had transgenderism, castrated males. Uh, She uh, encouraged lots of sexual sin and adultery. And also together when a child was conceived, you would offer your child as a sacrifice to the demons. Now, this is nothing more than pride, tolerance, diversity, um, and Planned Parenthood. Same spirits, new days, old demons. And what's interesting, we read this and we say, they were so primitive thinking that if they worship the earth and creation, that it would sustain their life and bless them. Let me show you what is right now on the front page of the United Nations website. Coming up in a few weeks, April 22nd, International Mother Earth Day. See, they would worship Baal and Ashtoreth so that the earth would bless them. And literally, this is the United Nations website. What are we doing with the earth? We're worshiping it. We're not raising our hands to the Lord and we're not honoring God as father. We're honoring earth as mother. You know what the word earth literally means? It's from the Norse earth goddess, Jord, also pronounced Jord. The word earth is an ancient Norse demon. That's what earth means. That's where we got the word. Here's what it says on the United Nations website. Mother Earth is clearly urging a call to action. So Mother Earth, she has a prophecy. Mother Earth is speaking and the prophets have heard and they're declaring the word of our mother. Mother Earth is clearly urging a call to action. So this is the United Nations imposing Baal and Asherah worship of fertility, earth creation and provision across the nations. We need a shift to a more sustainable economy that works for both people and the planet. Let's promote harmony with nature and the earth. 
See, God the Father said, be fruitful, multiply, increase in number, fill the earth, subdue it, exercise dominion. The counterfeit, Mother Earth comes and says, do not be fruitful, do not multiply, do not have children. If you have children, kill those children. Do not increase in number, do not fill the earth, do not subdue it, do not exercise dominion, do not create economies and cultures, worship me and obey me. I'm telling you that what is driving the Green New Deal, that what is driving environmental rights activism in its radical format is just Baal and Astra rebranded. Now I believe that this planet is a gift from God and we should be good stewards. Just like the body that God gives us, we should take good care of it, but we should use it. Similarly, the world that God has given us, we should take care of it, but we should use it because human life and flourishing is God's highest value. Now, let me say this, I'm I'm getting close to time. Um, Here's what happens when Jezebel and Ahab are at work. Let me skip some of my notes and just get to a summary. There are five things that happen in the days of Elijah that happen in our day. Number one, cancel the prophets, cancel them. Fired, deplatformed, terminated, attacked, cancel the prophets. Number two, close the churches and the schools. That's what they did. Close the churches and the schools. Number three, counterfeit the kingdom of God. Overtake politics, religion, family, sexuality, entertainment, and the economy. Number four, compromise the believers. Have them so fearful that they will bend their knee to bail. And number five, castrate the men. Jezebel surrounded by the eunuchs. Um, It wasn't in my notes, I'll just throw something out there. Uh, This week there was a school shooting in Nashville. You're like, what happened? Jezebel showed up. Gender confusion, mental health issues, all demonic, shows up, says, you know what? I am in control of this school and church. I'm in control, dominate and brings murder and death to innocent children and those who serve them. It's demonic, it's demonic. And what happens then is people come along and then the the, the argument from the left will be until uh, the manifesto comes out. And I don't know if they'll have the courage to release it, but if they do, I think it'll be revealing. The issue is, well, if you would have just tolerated them more, they would have not responded this way. It's like, oh. Oh, so if we tolerate Jezebel, she won't take over the church and the school and kill the children? That's a lie from the father of lies. And so, you know, thankfully, it's not like the previous shooting where it was a bunch of Ahabs first on scene. This time there were some Elijahs and they took care of it quickly. But in these moments, people are like, what happened? What's the cause? What, 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 what caused this to happen? It's unseen, yeah. it's demonic. Anytime someone who has not attended the school for 20 years shows up to shoot the children, that's control, that's demonic. That's a spiritual attack in the physical realm. Right? The Bible doesn't tell us just what happened, but what always happens. A couple of things I'll close with. Um, And I'll just say this, we need more prophets and less politicians. We need more prophets and less false prophets. Here's Elijah, he's up against politicians and 850 false prophets. Here, God has a problem with Ahab. The problem is between God and Ahab. God calls Elijah to pick a side. So Elijah, does not have a choice if he will get in trouble. His only choice is who he will get in trouble with. As a believer in this day, you need to know, you're going to get in trouble. The question is, who are you gonna get in trouble with and what are you gonna get in trouble for? Elijah's like, well, if you got a problem with God, I'm gonna have a problem with you. I don't want God to have a problem with me. There are times when you've gotta decide what side of the fight you're on. And you've got to have the courage to stand. In addition, 
being nice is not always being godly. I'll say it again. Being nice is not always being godly. Elijah's not a rude man. He's not, a, he's not an unloving man, but he's a direct and assertive man. And some of you have been wrongly told that, that to be a Christian, you should never have anyone dislike you. And then you give in to the spirit of fear of man. That you should only and always say nice things. That, that you should only and always make friends. Well, Elijah is a man of God and he's the most hated man in his nation because he's the one who will not bend his knee to Baal. What I think is really curious about Elijah, there's a hundred other prophets. What do they say? Nothing. Like, we agree, get him, brother. We'll pray for you from the cave. <laughs> okay. He's in the fight. He leads with a chin. What I love about Elijah, man, it's just, you know, hands up, chin down, feet forward. Would have been nice if one of the guys came out of the cave like, hey, bro. <laughs> nope. Now, the, the, the report in our day would be, Elijah is so mean. What kind of believer is this? It didn't rain for three and a half years. Look at the economy, look at the crops, look at the livestock. People are dying, our nation is struggling, our king is crying. What kind of Christian are you? An anointed one, repent and then there'll be rain. No repentance, no rain. In addition, an evil person thinks that the godly person is the problem. So they come face to face. What does Ahab say to Elijah? Oh, you're the troubler of Israel. You're the troublemaker, you're the trouble. Everything was fine. We were doing great. Economy was booming, sex was awesome. Crops were flourishing, you showed up. It's been really painful. You've caused a lot of trouble. We were rolling. You got in the way. If you wouldn't have showed up, we'd be doing great. If you would just shut up and go along, we'd be doing fine. He thinks that Elijah's the problem. Elijah's the solution. Now that being said, this word troubler it sometimes is translated asp or viper. What he's saying is, you're the devil. You're the devil. Our world today thinks that Christians are the devil and that Bible teaching is evil. You just need to know the, the day we live in, it's not just that the hardened in the culture disagree with us, they think we're evil. See, that's different. Because if you disagree with someone, you ignore them. But if they're evil, you have to stop them. That's the day we live in. You're a parent who thinks that there are two genders and you get to raise your child? You're a troubler. You think that the word of God is the highest authority? You're a troubler. You think Jesus Christ is Lord? You're a troubler. Let me just say this. Being a troubler is a ministry. Hey? That, this, people, I got asked me recently, like, you make a lot of trouble. I was like, that's my job. <laughs> the job is that at some point, <laughs> if the devil's gonna give us hell, we need to give him a little hell. That's right. hey, and sometimes making trouble and getting in trouble, well, that's a ministry. You're very controversial. Praise the Lord, at least you're listening, you know? <laughs> Now, and sometimes you have to fight. This is the time where Elijah needs to have the fight. There are times you need to have the conflict. You need to have the confrontation. You need to come out of the cave. Okay? And I'll, I'll close with this. This will be my close. Okay? This story is a little story and it's part of a much bigger story. It's the story of the Bible. Elijah is a type of Jesus and Jesus is the greater Elijah. When Jesus comes, he's like, who do people think I am? He's like, some people think you're Elijah. He is the greater Elijah. He is not just the man of God, but he is God become a man. But he is filled by the same spirit of Elijah. He's filled by the power of the Holy Spirit. And just as Elijah stood against the political and the religious leaders, so Jesus stood against the political and religious leaders. Just like they tried to kill 
Elijah, they tried to kill Jesus. Just like Satan was involved, Satan was working through all of the counterfeit false prophets of Baal and, and Asherah. So in the days of Jesus, Satan worked through the counterfeit and false disciple Judas. And then ultimately, Jesus Christ, the greater Elijah, not just a man of God, but God become a man, they killed him. This happened on Good Friday. This Friday, we've got a documentary going out. We're gonna tell you about the death of Jesus. Pray it reaches 10 million people, that's my prayer. And then what'll happen is next weekend, along with churches across the world, we're gonna get together, we're gonna celebrate Easter. And it is that our King Jesus conquers all kings and kingdoms. Our King Jesus rules and reigns over all demons. Our King Jesus forgives sin and he conquers death. And he's the greater Elijah. And we come together as the children of God to worship and to celebrate that we have a King who is the greater Elijah, amen? Let me pray and we'll worship. Father, thanks for a chance to teach your word. I love it, it's fun. We're rolling, we're having a good time. I pray against the enemy of servants, their works and effects. I pray for the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that right now, those who need encouragement would be encouraged. Those who need faith would receive faith. That those who need a word would receive a word. Holy Spirit, we invite you. Fill us as you did Elijah. Fill us as you did Jesus. As we come to worship Jesus in whose name we pray, amen. Please stand.